Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Milo Fowler. I know that he is a photographer, and it was interesting. Before we started, I said a prayer for us, and I asked that there would be light. I don't remember the exact words that I said, but I mentioned something about that. And as we went on, he ended up talking about light. I was just really grateful for that, for the witness of the Holy Ghost and for the blessing of light. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I really did. I'm so glad that he was able to come. And here's Milo. I am in my home today with my new friend, Milo Fowler. I'm so glad that he could be here. Milo, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Um, yeah, I um, have always uh, introduced myself by saying, uh, just like I saw my medicine men, grandpas, and, and uh, my, my grandmothers who were healers as well, always introduced themselves by saying, hello, my, uh, my relatives and my people. Um, and I always found that to be so beautiful. Um, there's no distinction. There's no like, you know, my family's over here and your family's over there, or there's no fences or lines. It's really when we look under the, you know, under the, the beautiful blanket of the universe and the stars, that's who we are, our relatives and, you know, my people, Shidana. Um, after that, I uh, continued with my clans. Um, our clans, uh, um, it's such a beautiful uh, system that allows us to know who we are related to. Um, you know, from my elders, my grandparents, I was always taught that we don't have cousins, you know, we, we have brothers and sisters. Yeah. And that was just um, so beautiful to know. And, and I love my clans because, um, you know, all of my uh, grandmas and grandpas, my great grandma, who we had, I just had the phenomenal fortune that she lived right next door to us, right? That there. is yeah. cool. Yeah. So uh, they're all not here. Uh, they're, as they would say, in the world of great spirits. And so now when I take some photographs or go do some humanitarian work and I meet a grandma or grandpa, we introduce ourselves and just talk in Navajo. And um, eventually at some point they'll they'll mention how we are related. And it's just uh, for a moment um, I get to be called, you know, a grandson or, you know, a maternal one or a paternal one or a brother or, you know, just speaking with these elders and again it's like wow i have another grandma i have another grandpa uh, a paternal grandpa a paternal grandma and and uh, those relationships are just so fun and beautiful and to a degree sacred to have you know even though my real grandmas and grandpas aren't here i i have others um and those teachings remind me of where i come from what that means and um how to continue to carry myself because they're watching me you know um, and I mentioned that my mother is from a place called Hoye in English. That would be Steamboat, Arizona. Really small place. Uh, when I was growing up there with my grandpa and my grandma living off the land, there was probably maybe two, 200 people that lived like really spread out. It's grown a little bit now, 
And my father's from uh, a place called uh, Beish Hagid, which is copper mine, and more specifically, Jada Habatim, uh, you know, by Antelope uh, Pass. There's an old trail where antelope and deer used to migrate uh, from the Grand Canyon up higher in elevation, and we live right along there. So that's more on the western part of uh, the of Navajo land. And I uh, mentioned that we live here now, and uh, my wife, my partner, her name is Lauren, and we have two kids, um, yeah, a son and a daughter. So that is us, and um, the name that was given to me is Milo, and that's what I am called. That's so great. I love it. Uh, now you've just shared a bunch of things that you already love about your heritage, but is there something else that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ that you would like to share? It can be pretty much anything. <laughs> There's so much, you know, um, there is, there's so much that I had, was already embracing or following. Um, I don't know if believing was, was ever an option. It was, it was really the way of life. I remember the very first time I learned about prayer was watching my grandma. I was a little kid, you know, um, watching her pray and, uh, be so grateful for this little watermelon that we were about to eat. And her prayer was just so, so deep, had roots, you know, it wasn't just something that's recited or that we just repeat on a regular basis. It was very, her prayers were always unique. Mm-hmm. Her, they, they were never the same. How she started and ended followed somewhat of a, of a pattern. Everything in between was never the same. And it was just a beautiful dialogue that she always had. And as a little kid, you know, before preschool, I was just like, Grandma, come on, finish the prayer. <laughs> My mouth is salivating, right? Like right now, you know, thinking about that watermelon in the hot July weather or whenever it was we were, you know, and and she just, she was just so grateful for the seeds, the dirt and the grains of sand, every storm that came by uh, to bless us with moisture so that that was a little bit less labor on our end to to have to bring the water to the watermelons or the corn or to the peaches or whatever we were growing, you know? And so, um, they were also my very first example of, I would say, uh, fasting, um, and, and giving, um, you know, we, luckily for us, we live very close to the only spring that was very, uh, that was very good at providing for the community. And so it was always, uh, interesting when, uh, community members would come by and they would always knock on our door or politely ask, can we have some of your water? And my grandma or my grandpa would always say, um, you know, like the water really isn't ours. You know, we, we oversee it. We're lucky to live by it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people would go back there with their wagons or their trucks or their horses or whatever they were using to get some water from the spring there. And then on their way back out, my grandma would see, you could see almost to the well from the front little porch, that the little deck that they had. And she would uh, send me out to the field. We had about 12 acres that we grew, where we grew everything that we ate. Um, and she would, you know, give me a little box or a grocery bag or something um, and ask me to get, you know, the zucchini, squash, a little pumpkin or, you know, honeydew, uh, corn, an ear or two, you know. And bring it back. And every time I went out, um, I was like, oh, man, tonight's dinner is going to taste so good. You know, like we're going to have a, an awesome amount of vegetables and fruit and, you know, go get some chicken eggs or whatever, you know. And I'd bring it back and then she'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, thank you, my child. And then as this family that's now exiting with water, she would take that bag or box or whatever and she'd wave them down. It's such it's such wait, wait. And then give that to them. I love that. And uh, I, I uh, just never forgot those early childhood lessons of, you know, someone just that was so concerned about giving, that was so um, interested in making sure people were well off, that they would be better because of the blessings that we had. And, and I saw this happen multiple times, multiple times until finally I had the courage to ask grandma, like, literally, why are we giving away the farm? You know, I work out there. It's hard. I cut myself and I'm sweaty. I'm sticky. And then she would just say, yeah, she has my child. Um, 
you know, do you know that family? Do you know how far they had to go just to get to the water that's so close to us? You know, and she really put that in perspective of like, you know, how much more blessed we were by being that much closer to the water. She's like, we're lucky we don't have to travel a whole day. We're lucky that we have to, you know, just go a little ways and there we are, you know, for this family or that family or that grandma that's got a disability or whatever it was. She really taught me of we, we can give. Um, and, um, I love one, one of my most favorite, I think moments in the book of Mormon was when, you know, Nephi, Lehi, Sarai, and the whole family makes this phenomenal, uh, voyage across into the unknown and they land. And I just love the very first thing Lehi does. He gives thanks and he starts planting, you know, and like. For some reason, Lehi knew the power of Mother Earth. He knew the power of nature. And um, obviously, you know, they, were, they, they didn't know what was here for, for possibly for, for a good part of their journey. However, um, the, you know, when Lehi, when I read that, I remember reading that for the very first time. I was like, wow, like there's some beautiful connection there of how critical the land is and um, you know, growing up with, with my grandma, my grandpa, herding sheep or being responsible for all 150 plus that we had. Um, I remember one time I was like, I think I was in first grade, maybe preschool. Um, and it was a long day and I came home and um, there's so much around that experience. I was herding sheep. Whereas when my grandpa went out, the sheep were following him. Mm. Big difference, you know. And so he could tell, you know, that one day, that one evening, just by him looking out and walking out a little ways, the sheep came to him and he said, there's two or three missing. They have this feature. They have this spot. But say, their tails are like this, you know, you know, on, on the spot right over here, it's black. That one is not here. He knew every one of them, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, our, our great creator um, knows every single one of us, knows the beautiful parts of all of us, uh, maybe some blemishes that we have or, or marks that we have, you know, it doesn't matter. That's how, you know, in his eyes, he says, hey, that one's, I, that one's not here. And then he sent me back out with a little flashlight and I never forgot that lesson either of like what it means to be responsible for, for, for what's in your care, you know? And I think spiritually there's, there's so much that, that, that I continue to pull from that on a daily basis. Um, I mean, they, they really were just incredible people, incredible humans that I, I, I sometimes, um, get lost in my thoughts like wow how how lucky i was as as a little kid to to live with them to learn from them to to laugh with them um and um you know just have many experiences with them and you know that continues to shape who i am today and and that is a massive part of my career as well yeah so you just you just laid out so many wonderful things. I man, I love how much your grandma in giving shows gratitude. Uh, I think gratitude is one of it's almost a forgotten skill these days in the world as a whole. I, I worry that too many people take things for granted and are not grateful for it. And by her example, you have learned gratitude and sharing and man that's awesome I'm so glad so you were raised next to them the all the way till you graduated from high school yeah yeah um you know as, as I got closer to high school um you know around middle school is is when a few of my uh, a couple of my grandparents passed away uh, they moved on as as we say um and um 
yeah, my great grandmother, I, I just was so happy that, uh, for a good chunk of the winters, she would stay at our house. Um, and my father was always away for work. I shouldn't say always, but however, uh, you know, he was often away for work sometimes, you know, in, in another state, uh, sometimes internationally, uh, he's been to like the Philippines and to South America. And so as a little kid, he showed me how to, you know, hunt in the wintertime and, and how to, uh, you know, track rabbits or, you know, things like that. Um, and then by the time I was in third grade, he also showed me how to, you know, check on the chainsaw, how to, how to put oil into it how to, how to sharpen it and how to use it. So he bought me a little cool chainsaw, yeah. um, and during that same time, he sh also showed me how to drive the truck um, on the dirt road. And so all of that really funneled on down to like, OK, there, there's there's really not a whole lot of reasons why, like in the wintertime, you know, there should be plenty of firewood because you know how to get the firewood mm -hmm. to keep your mom and your sisters warm and your, your great grandma. You know, uh, I'm the only boy in the family. So when my dad was away, he always said, hey, you're the man of the house now, you know, and and I, I, that, that meant a lot to me, you know, um, as a little kid that, that was really, um, such a, I'm all, I, as I look back on that, like, I can't thank my dad enough for that responsibility. And, um, so I, I kind of grew up pretty fast, you know, um, and with my grandma, my great grandma, grandma Sarah, um, she, she taught me so much as well. And I would say the greatest lesson that she gave me was you know one time we were outside talking about plants and seasons um she delivered my dad in september mm -hmm. um however on his birth certificate it shows that he was born in april because the number four and the number nine they look very similar yeah and so the funny thing is, too, is like my, I know exactly where my dad, the tree that he was born under. Yeah. However, on his birth certificate, it showed that he was born at a hospital. What? <laughs> yeah. Which is like an hour and a half away. You know, it's like, oh, my goodness. Um, and so my great grandma, Sarah, was like, no, your dad wasn't born then. Because during that time, this is what the lambs look like. This yeah. is what this, you know, what the sage looks like. You yeah. Know? And she was really descriptive of and, and knew the complete difference of the plants and nature and the stars and just so much. And I was like, wow, grandma was so dialed, you know? And she said one time, okay, um, um, you know, you know, a long time ago, there was never really a hospital. And she basically said, you know, we had to make words, new words for that, mm -hmm. for different things. Yeah. You know, not just hospital, but like, um, you know, like, rings or you know vehicles and parts of vehicles and now our language is continuing to expand so that we can you know describe a state or another country um and um you know she was talking about the plants and how to mix certain plants um and then you know she said you know that that's our medicine this has always been our medicine out here in nature nature is beautiful and powerful and she said, we never had a word for hospital and we made it. However, and she said, and we are also each other's medicine. Uh, you know, don't, don't ever forget that, you know? And as, as you talk about gratitude, um, you know, often how much, how blessed are we when we really analyze what comes into our lives? Um, I, I think that would just be an overwhelming, such an overwhelming task to really identify like, wow, I'm grateful for water. I'm grateful for friends. I'm grateful for so many different things, you know? Um, and I think at the same time, we have those gifts and blessings that can help somebody else out, you know? And my grandma was always, my grandpa too, he's always, they were always like, there's something, there's a reason why you were born. There's a reason why you were created. There's something that only you possess. Only you have that out of everybody that's ever lived and that will live. And everybody has that as well. And they just said, Hashit Ao, somehow um, that's going to help somebody else. And, you know, make sure you're, you, you're able to help people. And so that's, for me, that's how I show my gratitude to 
my heavenly father is that like i know i'm really good at photography i know uh you know there's certain gifts that i have that are just like second nature for me you know cooking probably not that great (laughs) or you know like uh fixing a piano that's not my thing right um singing absolutely horrible you know but you know if there's a storm and somebody's broke down on the side of the road and you know their hoods up along the freeway i'm your guy you know in a very humble way in a very brave way like i know i can be this person's you know be there to help them and i think all of us have that gift as well to where when that kind of help is needed i hope we step step out and say hey i can help you with that yeah well, I, man i love that i totally agree i was just thinking about gifts of the spirit um because of um jeff young's episode that i just posted um and how our gifts of the spirit don't have to be the ones listed in the scriptures but they can be stopping on the side of the road to help somebody they can be it those are actually gifts of the spirit so i thanks for bringing that up were you raised as a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints uh no no i wasn't it is it happened when i was um about 15 years old um, back then in Arizona, I forget how old you could be to drive. Um, you know, by the time I was 15, I mean, I had already so many miles. <laughs> yeah. A lot of miles uh, on, on the res roads, you know, and had, re- you know, repaired a motor transmission, like really took an engine apart with my dad and put it all back together. And he really wanted me to be aware of that. So if he was like in some other state or country, I could identify the source of the problem. And then he's like, yeah, you just fix it like this, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it was one, one evening, uh, it was in February. Um, I was driving to Page to haul water for our cows and horses, my grandpa's cows and horses. And, um, you know, in the evening time there around four or five o'clock, it's starting to get dark. You know, now it's, it gets dark around like eight o'clock still, you know? And, um, once from our house to the highway, it's two miles right on the dot. And once you get on the highway, there's, a, a mile and a quarter, it's just a straightaway. So there's like no turns and you can see both ways really easily. I got on the highway and, and up ahead, I, I was like, did they put some new like milepost signs or new road signs along the highway? Cause like something's different a mile down the road. And I got closer and closer and it was these two, um, to two guys, young guys in a suit. It's February, so it's kind of cold still. And um, I roll my window down with a hand crank and slowly pull over. I said, hey, did you guys break down? Like, uh, where are you guys trying to go? They're like, oh, no, we didn't break down. We're, we're just hitchhiking, and we just got dropped off right here, and uh, we're we're on our way to Paige. And I was like, all right, cool. Well, um, you're walking the right way, so we'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> and I took off just like, you know, a hundred yards and they're just running, waving their hands. And I turned around and I was like, I'm just messing around with you. I'll, I'll give you guys a ride to town. I mean, that's 20, 20, 21 miles away from town. And they jumped in and, um, you know, they introduced themselves as Elder, um, Elder Landon and Elder Ford. Um, I was driving a Chevy truck and I said, oh, Elder Ford, that's not, it's not looking good for you, buddy. <laughs> Uh, and we, we were just laughing and the whole time, I mean, we, we, um, just talked about everything. Um, I, I think interestingly, a lot of people would say they would be, they, they would be bad missionaries. They were the best missionaries. Uh, we didn't talk once about the gospel. You know, we talked about, you know, the horses, school, um, cross country, um, you know, sports, family, we talked about everything but the gospel and I, and, um, and I think for me that as I look back on it now, that was just so natural. It wasn't so robotic, so scripted, you know, like they're humans. They, they have, they have a life, they have interest. They, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to say they're normal people, you know, they're, they're not just like rinse and repeat Jesus 24 seven, you know? Um, so I take him to town, I drop them off and, 
Um, and I remember I went to the first grocery store and I, I bought like bread. And before I left our house, I went to my aunt and my uncle's homes. I said, hey, I'm making a run to town. Anybody need anything? And, uh, you know, if you give me, you know, wheat bread or cereal or whatever, steak, you know. And so I went and got the stuff that didn't need to be refrigerated. And then I filled up, you know, our water tank, about 500 gallons. And then I went back to the grocery store again. And that's where I bought like ice cream, steak, milk, the stuff that, you know, needed to be to stay cold. Threw that in a little ice chest that we had. And I went home, um, dropped off the meat and um, you know, ice cream. Uh, and then I went to the horse corral and then unloaded all the water. Um, and then I got back home by this time it was like eight o'clock sun's down, it's dark, you know, and I was grabbing the grocery bags, uh, of like the cereal and, you know, like crackers and things like that. And then there was a book there and I, I knew instantly that was not my book because at the time I hated reading. Uh-huh. I hated reading anything. So I was like, ah, oh, this ain't my book. Yeah. I was like, oh, maybe it's maybe my mom, my dad, my sister is one of them. And so I just brought it in, um, put everything away. And then the next day I asked like, hey, did anybody leave a book in the truck? You know, and they're like, oh, no. So I was like, all right, well, this is interesting. And so um, I hung on, I just hung on to the book for a while. Um, I didn't open it because, you know, it's it's not, doesn't it belong to anybody book. yeah it's not mm-hmm. mine it's not anybody in my family's it doesn't mean anything to me it's just this weird yeah book. and i had no interest in opening it because i'd i'd rather go ride horses than read a book you know <laughs> um until finally one day a couple of weeks went by I, I looked at it and i just remember this like interesting feeling that i had of like struggling to open it you know it was like something didn't want me to to see what was inside there, you know. And I thought I was like, you know what, this isn't my book, it doesn't belong to me. And I said, you know what, let me I'll just open the first part of it and maybe because in, in a lot of like books says this book belongs to, you know, like a little blank line. So maybe there's one of those in there and see whose name, or maybe there's an address or uh maybe maybe a home phone number if if somebody had that, you know, and there wasn't. Um and um, I was reading the introduction. I was like, what's this book about? And said, oh, here's an introduction, you know. I think there's nine or ten paragraphs. I don't really remember right now. However, I do remember one thing I never forgot was reading in the third paragraph. It said, it's different now. The scriptures that I had before they were changed back then, it said, after thousands of years, all were destroyed except the Lamanites, who are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. And that really hit me because um, in my hometown in Page, um, Arizona, northern part of Arizona, it's right outside of Lake Powell. Page became a big uh, city when at one point it was the world's largest trailer park, you know, and, and that was because people were moving there. F- engineers. So fast. Yeah, so fast because of the dam, the Glen Canyon Dam. People from all over were come in there with their their background and their faith their food their family whatever it was you know and so there's one main street through town and there's um i think like 16 or 17 churches one right after the the other um and so row yeah church row yeah locals we call that holy curve (laughs) you know (laughs) because on the opposite side of that's the high school baseball fields yeah so it's got the curves you know and so and every time i rode the bus in the morning to school you know um I was always curious and shocked at the same time. It's like all these clowns right here, like, you know, this, everything on their front door or the street facing wall either says, you know, God or Jesus Christ or some sort of reference to that. And I always wondered why don't these guys just all build one big building and all go in together because it sounds like they're talking about the same thing. Such an interesting perspective. Yeah. And, and what was also very interesting is that if a lot of them also carried the same name, why were there walls in between each property, so to speak? Why weren't they open? Why weren't there walkways? Why weren't there bridges? Why weren't there? My first interesting visual at like, what a community is. And at that moment I thought it wasn't, 
you know, there's clearly some differences, like some boundaries, like. We don't give what's on our field, even though we have the water. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I saw that, um, I started really diving into, okay, there's this building, you know, with this name on there and I want to learn about them. So I got a chance to really learn about all of them and, and quite a few similarities, you know, and some, some differences, some major, some minor. Um, and I started looking into spirituality as well. Um, you know, I was in high school and was like, Oh, what am I going to do after this? And I really wanted to follow a bit of the lifestyle that my grandpa and my grandmas had them being medicine men and healers where they were really useful people, you know, they, they made the world better. And I wanted to emulate that to some degree as well. Um, and um, I continued to, at that point, continued to read a little bit more, uh, you know, past the introduction. And, and I was just like, wow, this is, this is fascinating, new, some of these words, like what the heck? And then uh, there's this um, incredible family that I, I've done a very poor job at thanking them after I left high school, I would say. Yeah, after I left high school, I, um, I think about them every, almost every other day, you know. And, and they took me in as, as one of their own. I, I could go to their house at any time I wanted, mm -hmm. walk right in, take a shower, make a sandwich, watch TV. Um, and they taught me, you know, a few things and, um, as well. And, and I love them, you know, the Johnsons. Um, and they're from Lichii. Um, you know, Frankie and Karen, Dolores and Roger, uh, Joanne and Vincent. Um, I was just so impressed by that family. Um, and so one day I walked in to their house, just like it was my own house, you know? And I was like, Hey, I'm just going to make a quick sandwich. And they're like, shh. I was like, Oh, got people here. Sorry. I'll, you know, I'll just wait over here. And, and, um, they were done and they had said a prayer because I heard everybody say amen at the end. I was like, oh, what's going on here, you know? And so at that point, everybody came into the kitchen and there's those two white guys again. The same ones. I said, hey, did you guys, um, I picked you up, it was a while ago, I picked you up and um, ever since then, um, I've had this book with me. I've been trying to find you guys. Because I've asked everybody in my family and those that have been in that truck. And there's a book of here that doesn't belong to anybody. And it has to belong to one of you two. And they're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that, that is ours. Where was it? I was like, oh, it was on the floorboard in my truck. And the, um, you know, back then, Paige was part of the Albuquerque mission. I think Paige was the furthest from Albuquerque. And they were so happy to have that book because they ran out of like, you know, brochures, cards, and just like material, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and they're like, oh, we were going to, we our plan was we were going to give that to this other family. Uh, I was like, oh, man, I'm so sorry I hung on to it for, I didn't open it at all for a while. I didn't know, you know? And so here you go. And I just remember giving it to them. I was like, well, uh, they're like, you know, thanks for taking care of it for us. And I was like, all right, yeah. I was like, well, I've, I've got a few questions. Um <laughs> You know, I, I started reading it and um, it's it's unique of an experience, you know, because I've been I, I've been through quite a few ceremonies, you know, through like the Native American church, through um, the Navajo you know, tradition as well. And, um, you know, quite quite a few sacred spiritual ones, you know, and. I said, you know, when, whenever I get into that book, there's just something interesting and unique that I feel about it. Um, I said, and they're like, well, we, we got to go and we're going to meet with this other family. But what if we go out to your house? We, we kind of know where you live. I was like, oh, no, you guys cannot come to my house because <laughs> my mom and my dad, um, they love a lot of people. They, they never say bad things about people. I, I just don't think they would be comfortable with what I'm doing. Um, and so then that's when I asked 
um, Frankie and Karen, um, you know, obviously these guys are here. They know where you live. Like, could I meet them here after like cross country practice or whenever we can? And they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. You know? And I just remember them saying like, but you need, you need to tell your mom and your dad that this is happening. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll definitely do that. You know, I never did. (laughs) I never did. Um, So we continued to meet uh, there and ask questions. And uh, then it came time to really pray and ask about everything that I was learning about, you know. And so, um, and then the, the missionaries, Elder Land gave me this form that I needed my parents to sign which was about baptism because I was a minor. By now, I was 16 years old. Um, I said, oh, yeah, no problem. I'm I'm sure they'll, I've been telling them about what we've been talking about, and they'll be good. They'll sign this easily, you know. So being in cross-country practice, I used to ask my mom, like, hey, mom, can I have 50 cents? Can I get 50 cents from your your coin wallet out of your purse? This is in the evening when I got home. She said, yeah, just get it. And and I said, oh, mom, you only have a quarter. And I said, hey, dad, could could I get maybe 50 cents or a dollar from your wallet so I can get, you know, Gatorade or a snack after practice. And they're like, yeah, just get it out of my wallet. I would do that. And at the same time, I would grab both of their driver's licenses. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm just going to do my homework. And so I would, you know, because we lived in a Hogan, you know, it was probably 600 square feet. I mean, it definitely wasn't a big room. You know, it wasn't, I mean, we had no rooms. Um, and so I would just put a sheet over my, like I was, I always did my homework like that just so that everyone could go to sleep. Um, and so I would do my homework. And after that, I just have just one sheet. I would just practice over and over and over again, writing my mom's signature and my dad's signature. And then one thing my dad always asked me to do during when it's cold is like, you know, before you're ready to fall asleep, just put one or two more logs in the fire so that, you know, that at least for a while we would kind of have some warmth. And so I would do that, and then I would grab that piece of paper that I signed my mom and dad's signature, and I put it in the fire, so there was ever no, there was never no trace of it, you know. Um, and so finally, I say, "All right, it's time." After a while, I was like, "All right, it's time." Got that paper, I unfolded it and signed it just like my mom, and signed it just like my dad. And man, it was on the money because I had practiced writing their signature hundreds and hundreds of times. And I folded up. I could not sleep that night. I just remember I was tossing and turning. And my mom and dad, you know, next morning, they're like, do you have, a, do you have bad dreams? What's, are you sore? What's going on? Do you have leg cramps? It's like, ah, no, I just got this big thing coming up tomorrow. I'm just really worried about it. Um, so then I meet the, the missionaries again over at uh, Frankie and Karen's house and the Johnsons. And uh, the missionaries were there. I said, hey, got it. It's all done. Let's do this. And I just remember that folded up piece of paper, I gave it to Elder Landon. And he just looked at me and he just said, you know, Elder Landon, we called him Elder de Bayaja, which, you know, he's Elder Lamb because his hair was just like a baby lamb. Oh, yeah. Yeah, white guy from Idaho, really cool guy. Um, and he just said, you know, brother, you know, the great spirit's telling me something right now that your mom and your dad didn't sign this. And he just asked me this powerful question. And he said, why do I feel this way? And I just remember just looking at him. I was like, and I, just, I remember asking him, like, how did you know? And he said, he then said the very next thing, which I never forgot was, you know, when you go on your mission, the great spirit's going to help you a lot. You know, this is how the great spirit is helping me right now. And and then he's like, I, I, I really believe your mom and your dad didn't sign this. Am I right? And I was like, yeah, you're right. And then he's like, I appreciate your bravery. I really appreciate what you want to do, but we can't do it this way. And he said, we need to go revisit some commandments of honoring your mom and your dad, you know. And we laughed. And I was like, all right, you know. And so after that, I talked to my mom and my dad. And about a month prior to all of this, my dad, he would always teach me just like my grandpa did. You know, my grandmas did. They take me out. And he taught me on this hill. Um, I don't, 
um, remember uh, when it was. However, the thing I remember most was my dad saying, hey, you're, you're a teenager now. Pretty soon you're going to be out of high school and you're going to need to start making some big decisions and with like your running if you want to take that into college and get scholarships. There's a lot you got to commit to. My dad was a bull rider, a really good one too. Him and his brother Stanley, they were really incredible. And so it was like, you know, sometimes you, you get bucked off and it's hard. Sometimes you land on your feet. Other times you, you, you land in a way that you weren't ready for. And that's life. What matters most is you get back up and, and you get on to the next one, you know. He just gave me so much advice about decision making and uh, which paths to take, you know. And, and he said, you know, we've been here talking for about an hour or so. We saw some hawks go by and, you know, they're spiritual creatures too. And, and my dad's like, you know, but never once have you looked at your feet. Sometimes in life, you, you just got to look at where you're standing and realize that you might feel like you're in quicksand. You might feel like you're stuck in the mud. You might feel like you're in two or three feet of snow and, and you, you're trying to get to a place. And, you know, all you can do at that time is just take that next step which was a beautiful lesson, you know, that just take one step and you're that much closer. How cool is that, you know? And then he said, however, where we're standing right now, you 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 haven't looked at where you're standing because if you did, and I just remember my dad looking out into the distance and he said, right in front of your right foot, you know, about seven or eight inches to the right, there's an arrowhead. And I looked down at my feet, and sure enough, there was an arrowhead right there. Never touched, never moved. You can tell it was just, you know, not cemented like concrete is, but the dirt was just like preserving it, holding it in place. He didn't come down to touch it or pick it up. I didn't either. And he said, "You're in, throughout your life, you're going to find these times where certain things are going to point you in the direction you ought to go, you know. And so when when I went back home after talking with the missionaries, um, after they discovered that I forged my mom and my dad's signature, I brought that conversation back up to my mom and my dad, especially my dad. I said, Dad, do you remember just very recently we went to the hill and you're talking about where we stand, the paths we take, getting back up. And also sometimes we get these pointers that guide us. It's like, for me, that's how I feel. This is one of those decisions I need to make. So whether you sign this paper right now or not, you know, when I, when I turn 18, I really feel like for some reason, this is my path. I don't know why. I don't know all the answers. But th however, one thing I do know is that this is my way. And uh, and it, 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 this is it, Dad. Can you please sign this paper? Um, and so he said, sure, yeah, we'll do it. And they both signed it. Um, and I, and then they're like, it says, you know, when when's your baptism day? I was like, oh, I want that to be around um, Father's Day because my mom's birthday is around Father's Day. I said, you know, this is a, my mom was a single mom for, for quite some time. And I can't begin to say much about her because I break down. Um, and then I wanted to correlate this new path with, with, with her, you know, in mind as well. And so they said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be at your baptism. And after that, then we got to go to steamboat to your grandma's house to, to help out with, you know, the, the, the farm, the crops. This is in June. I said, okay, yeah, we can do that. No problem. And then I said, but I'm going to be at my friend's house because of practice and, Friday night, I'll come back first thing Saturday morning. Then we can go get baptized. And then after that, we'll leave. Um, I get back home and there's a note that said, hey, we already left. You know, and so, but, but I mean, by this time, you know, being in high school, um, I was already, you know, uh, going to seminary. I, w I would lie to go to seminary, you know, with my my English classes or my like maybe geology or my science class said, Hey, I got to go to the library. I got to go print off this one thing. It was part of my report or whatever. And had all my homework done 
and I'd get the pass to leave. And I'd just basically go to seminary during that time because it wasn't part of my schedule. Um, and uh, school for us on Wednesdays started at about 9.15, I think it was, instead of 8 o'clock. And so in the early mornings, I would ride my bike to school. Uh, I would ride my bike to church. And one way, it was like 22 miles. Um, and the truck keys weren't there. And so I was like, all right, well, this is interesting. Like, I, I have no excuses, you know, if I got to run the to town to get baptized, I'll do it. And it's basically what happened. Have they accepted your membership in this church? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they have just been phenomenally supportive, you know, the, and, and, and they both come from this lineage that I talk about, you know, of like thinking of others you know, showing no judgment. Um, I, I rarely, I've never heard my mom talk bad about anyone, you know. Um, she, my mom's got a big heart. She's always packing her pots and pans and saying, oh, I got to go help at this ceremony or I got to go help at this funeral. And um, she's just like my grandma, you know, always helping and and my dad is just i mean he's a bull rider you know he's got a hard head and you know deep down he's got a soft heart you know he's got a big heart of love and like his his people mean a lot to him you know um you know some some one fun meaningful thing we always did ever since i could walk was every winter we'd every fall we'd always go out and get firewood you know he we the first couple of truckloads were always for other people, you know, for elders, you know, those that couldn't swing an ax anymore. And it's just a beautiful thing that, that I want to continue doing, you know, um, they love, um, they'll help people whenever they can. One time, one Thanksgiving, there was a, a French couple that somehow got lost off the highway <laughs> and they ended up at our family's Thanksgiving dinner. And, uh, I get a call from my dad. He's like, hey, I need you to talk to these people. I was like, whoo, hold on. And he gives me the phone. And then it's French. And then I was like, oh, wow. Oui, bonjour. Comment ça va? Tu va bien? Ça va bien? <laughs> I served my mission in France. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and my dad was like, hold on. It's, it's, wait, wait. Hey, make sure, make sure they know they can stay here and, and they can eat with us. You know? Was, All right. And so I told him, yeah, vous pouvez manger avec ma famille. You know, you can eat with my family. Um, and, and so that's my dad. He's cool. I learned so much from him and, um, he's not my biological father. However, he's the only man I'll ever call my dad, you know? Um, so yeah, the, uh, you know, when I was after high school and, you know, after college, I, I, or st went to a year of college then moved to Huntington beach after another big prayer, I had like 200 bucks to my name, lived out of a car for a minute <laughs> found a job and you know at that time you know my mom and my dad were like what are you thinking about going on a mission um they're like, the ones that asked you about it yeah i said you know I, I, it's on my mind you know my one of my best buddies went to honduras his name is conan and the other one you know marvin went to venezuela gerald went to montana and yeah you know, my buddies were going left and right and and i was on the beach in california uh, and that's when I realized, like, all right, yeah, that that's the next thing. And I went back home and I said, look, I, I, I really think this is what I need to do. I really feel it. You know, this is one of those arrowheads in my life uh, that's pointing me in this direction. And and so I I, I made uh, quite a bit of money in California. And then uh, my dad got sick, and so then a lot of that burden, a lot of that weight was on my mom. And and slowly you know i saw that bank account go from you know a nice size to lower and lower and lower until i just remember walking into to my bishop's office bishop phil lynn amazing guy from wyoming cowboy mm -hmm. belagana guy in Meriden, navajo i just i just remember crying and i said look bishop like i had all this money saved and 
I, I was helping my mom, my dad with things. And, um, yeah, I think I can maybe put a suit together. I've, I bought a jacket over here at this thrift store and I've, I got some suit pants over here and at least my shoes match, you know, and I think I could buy a tie. And the funny thing is that's actually the photo I took of just this mismatch suit and tie and setup. And that was my mission photo. Um, and um and the first, the only thing he he asked me was like have, have you been paying your tithing i i said yeah bish I, i've been paying that I, i've been given more than than i need to and and then he just said beautifully and powerfully very stern he said then then what are you afraid of i was like the great creator does he not say that he'll open, you know, the windows of heaven? And then we went to the scriptures and he had me read it. He said, what does it say there? That, does he say he's going to open, you know, a car door? Does he say he's going to open, you know, something small, like a little window? Is that, do you know how big heaven is? I was like, no, I don't. He's like, I don't, I don't know if anybody knows, but... He's like, I can tell you, it's not a small house. That place is packed, you know, with, with a lot. And when when the creator says he, he'll open it up, he'll open it up. So you got nothing to worry about, you know. Just keep doing what you're doing. And and um, he just gave me one of his stern, you know, he, he had like calluses and just worn leather hands. Um, and he just looked me with just like the kindest eyes. With, with all the confidence anybody would ever want to have to approach any anything hard or whatever, you know. And he said, just wait. And then he had me go out. And then next week, the week after that was fast and testimony meeting. Um, I bore my testimony. And after that, this couple came up. And they said, hey, we're from Salt Lake City, Utah. The other night, my wife and I, we were praying and the spirit came into our room and basically all we were told was to start heading south, start driving south. Um, and so they like, oh, this is weird. What What's this about? You know, <laughs> this doesn't happen. What? Leave our home. And so they drove south, start driving south. And they said every little town we got to, we prayed like, is this where we need to go? Is this where we need to go? And. Sometimes the prayers were get off the freeway here. Which way? Just follow the voice, you know, and follow the feelings, the promptings. And, and they did. And a few days later, they ended up in my home ward. And, and then they're like, you're, you're who we need to help. Um, and so... Even even though I had run out of money, um, they they paid for my mission. When I was serving my mission in southern France, they became mission president in Africa. Um, and I remember writing to them um, on my mission. So so when that happened, I was like, you know, I just thought about my grandma. You know, always giving away corn, watermelon, peaches, chicken, a lamb, a goat, whatever we had, you know. She said, we can afford to give. This is how we show we're grateful for what we have. And that somehow, I don't know, somehow we'll be able to be okay. We'll always be okay if we treat others with love, you know. And that that's how I got to go on my mission and and just so many of the of these experiences that I had have have formed like after my mission I went to college and I you know up in up at Utah State I was there for two and a half months and I said you know Heavenly Father Creator like I, I just feel like I'm in the wrong place you know I, I felt the feeling that I have right now I felt that on my mission going down you know alleys or whatever you know and and other times it's, you know, turn here, turn here, and somehow, boom, 
this family's there that we've been trying to talk to for a minute, you know? It's like, I feel the same way. Like, I, I don't know. I don't really feel like that. that's where I need to be. What, regardless, give me, give me a direction so that I can at least do what you want me to do and, and help people. And I just remember praying just so earnestly and wanting, you know. And I just remember saying, like, whatever it is you tell me, I will do my best to help other people with whatever that is. Um, and then at that moment, I just really felt in the car just by myself, like, pick up a camera and I will show you some of the greatest light. And through your images, people will know there is a great creator. Like, that was... I never forgot those words, just like some that I heard from my grandma, my grandpa, you know. And and for like the next couple of minutes, I was like, what the heck? Pick up a camera. I, I don't even own a camera. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know anything about photography. What? what? I'm in college. How, how? And so I was like, all right, whatever. And I remember having that prayer just a little bit south of Richfield along the Severe River, like at two in the morning trying to make it back to my 8 a.m., you know, class. And I got back and and I just loaded up whatever I had in my my, uh, my apartment, which I feel really bad because a lot of people stepped into to, to make some changes. Some guy named Roger up at Logan, Utah State in the Blue Light Building. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and I just left and just told the guys, like, hey, my path is somewhere out there and we'll see you down the road. And I hope you guys are on yours, you know, hope you find yours. Now I'm, you know, one of very few indigenous full-time photographers and um, I contribute to national geographic and, you know, just been on a lot of really amazing assignments to like Iceland and Alaska and just came back from one, uh, you know, all around the grand Canyon uh, about, land that is important to indigenous tribes indigenous people in that area and um and that has opened so many doors to give back you know like it started by selling some of my photographs so that you know i know this grandma uh, in chinley arizona i know this single mom that's in many farms i know this other you know single dad that's got you know seven kids under the same house three are his the others are, you know, his his nieces and nephews that he's trying to help out. And so from then it was like, you know, I'm, I want to help power these homes because I know what it's like to grow up without electricity. To do your homework with a flashlight under a sheet and you fall behind. Your grades suffer and that can affect you, you know, emotionally, mentally and um, with sports as well, you know. And, from then on, it ju I just focused on understanding and controlling light through photography and, and giving light because, you know, it's amazing. Like, it's the monsoon season right now. You know, when the power goes out, we're without power for an hour or two or the night. And when electricity comes back on, even here in Utah, like, everyone tends to take this sigh of relief that the power's back on. I can see where I'm going. It's almost the same thing back home when, you know, you install a solar panel, a battery and some lights and it's dark and somebody hits the switch and their home lights up, you know. I think in so many ways, Heavenly Father's done that for me when I felt like I was in a, I was wandering in darkness, whether that's because of the decisions that I had made or, just because that's part of life, being six feet above ground, you know? Um, and every now and then, Heavenly Father turns on the light, and for a moment, I get to see where I'm going, and it's just as beautiful, like, wow, this blessing I know that can only come from the ultimate source of light. I'm, I'm just blown away by all the things that you've just taught. But I do have one final question. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? That's a great question. Um, 
I, I think the key word in that for me is belong. When you when you know you belong to a family, when you know you're you know, I, I've seen little lambs get lost or I wasn't, you know, taking care of them enough and, and they come back into the fold. They start bouncing around or bucking around, you know, and they're they're you can visually see they're they're back home, you know. They're part of this community. They feel differently. For me, what does it mean to know I belong to the tribe of Israel? It knows that. It has me feel like I know I belong to something that is greater than myself. I belong to a creation. I belong to a community and it goes back to the very same thing that I said at the beginning of this conversation is Yat Eshk E Doshidine Hello my relatives and my people. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Today in Sacrament Meeting I listened to 12 young men sing a song. It's called If the Savior Stood Beside Me by Sally DeFord. And um, these young men sing verses of this song that I have never heard before. And so I asked the pianist if I could get a copy of those verses. She said that Sally DeFord did write these extra verses. I've heard my my primary kids sing it, but I have never heard these. So I want to share them to you today, with you today, because they are really powerful. I don't know why we don't have them in the children's songbook, because these are pretty awesome. So the ones that are... I'm going to start with these. If the Savior stood beside me, would I do the things I do? Would I think of his commandments and try harder to be true? Would I follow his example? Would I live more righteously if I could see see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me? If the Savior stood beside me, would I say the things I say? Would my words be true and kind if he were never far away? Would I try to share the gospel? Would I speak more reverently if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me? Now, those two are are in the children's songbook. The the next three are not. So here they are. If the Savior stood beside me, would I often kneel to pray? Would I listen to the Spirit's voice and hasten to obey? Would I count my many blessings? Would I praise Him gratefully if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me? If the Savior stood beside me, would I comfort those in need? Would I try to show the Savior's love in every word and deed? Would I give to those who hunger? Would I serve more willingly if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me? If the Savior stood beside me, would my thoughts be clean and pure? Would his presence give me strength and hope and courage to endure? Would his counsel give my action, guide my actions? Would I choose more worthily if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me? me? And then this is the third verse that's in the in the children's songbook. He is always near me, though I do not see him there. And because he loves me dearly, I am in his watchful care. So I'll be the kind of person that I know I'd like to be if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me. I have been listening to podcasts and thinking about the atonement a lot this week. And those middle verses, those new ones really, really meant something to me today. I hope that they mean something to you, and I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. 
I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.